my name's Sean Mullen. I'm from IBM. Uh, with me is Jeff Roses, Stephen Suhu, and Henry Nash. So we're going to talk about uh, we're going to talk about a, a issue that we have, and and I think there's a few people here late on the late on a Thursday. So apparently it's of interest to you guys also. So let me just kind of jump right into it. There we go. So here's here's kind of the customer's problem space. The customer's problem space is they want to bring services to the cloud, right? And the services are going to do something. They're going to, I don't know, it could be gaming, it could be financial, it could be research, scientific, anything like that. But what they want to focus on is what goes in the box, right? They don't want to use the auth i, the authentication. They don't want to reinvent that. And they don't want to reinvent or write authorization code. If somebody comes there, we can identify them, right? Now that I've identified them, what are they allowed to do, the authorization piece? So if you can kind of provide that, if you can provide that in your cloud platform, then you have a way for services just to focus on whatever their core service is. Again, it could gaming, financial, research, scientific, anything like that. So I think there's an echo off of this guy. So that's what, we're, that's what we worked on and that's what the demo will show is if we look at this in a cloud, if we look at this in an in a, uh, open stack view of things, right, you come in and you authenticate to Keystone, right? You provide user ID and password or it could be service to service where you would provide a service ID and a key that goes along with that service ID. So when we do this, as we probably all know, in the OpenStack sense of thing, you hit OpenStack and you get one of the, the different types of tokens it supports, like a Fernet or a PKI or whatever your choice is on that. Now, once we've identified that person, it hits the authorization, and that's how we define it today is with the policy.json. Policy.json rules, here's our rules, this person is, has this role, they're allowed to do these things. So that's the problem space for the customer we're trying to solve. Here's a little bit in our personal world that we're trying to solve. So we work for IBM and we have a, a group of cloud platforms we have to support and our customers, maybe they're in these same positions and also they're in legacy systems. So if you look at OpenStack, Cloud Foundry, SoftLayer is IBM's proprietary cloud platform. Right? It uses a system called IMS, Infrastructure Management Services. And we also, our customers, have these legacy systems, right? So if we look across in the authentication piece, we, we can, we've done some work for single sign-on. So what we're finding is, is that the authentication piece, the authentication piece is fairly easy because we have a variety of protocols and we'll kind of look at those that allow single sign-on and if I can identify you, you provide your credentials, I can use those credentials across the platforms. Now sometimes we have to do little tricks with that because once you authenticate into one system, once you authenticate into one system, let's say Cloud Foundry, I authenticate user password and I get a UAA token, which is Cloud Foundry speak, it's uh, user account authentication, user account authentication. I have that token, I call down into the services, all the Cloud Foundry services like recognize that. But if I need to call across to OpenStack or I need to call, call across to SoftLayer, for example, that service just knows my authentication through a UAA token. When that service tries to call over and say, hey, show me all of, Sean wants to know all of his resources across all the cloud platforms, you have to go and you have to exchange that token for a token that the other platform understands. So we developed a, a token exchange service. So we're doing that stuff, but still this is all around identity. It can figure out, I can say, I'm just, I, I authenticated, so I'm Sean here, I exchange tokens, and it goes, oh yeah, I know it's Sean over here. But the harder part is the authorization piece. And so that's what we'll talk about is the access control across all of those 
uh, platform layers. How do we come and break this out so we have a unified system, one way to define it and one way that all the platforms recognize? So we're going to do, I think, probably the majority of you guys are security guys, but I do want to run through this. So here's, what, here's the terminology we're going to use throughout this. So this is, this is a, a internet RFC, a request for comment, and I have it up there, 2904. We have our policy administration point. Now we're going to go back to that problem space I was talking about. How do you do access control across all of these? Well, you also have to have a way to configure that to say, you know, Sean can see these things, he can write to this, he can update that, but it has to be a system that you can administer. Somebody has to grant you that access. And that's going to be something, you know, we as a cloud provider don't know. Because I'm a service and I'm going to come in here and I'm going to say, we'll use the simple CRUD. You can create, read, update, delete, right? So in that, in creating this PAP, the policy administration point, it has to be something that the user can get their head around and configure. So it has to be a very easy way to do this across a very broad expanse of multiple cloud platforms and hundreds, thousands of different resources across those. But so when that service comes in and this service um, does something financial and this service does something gaming and entertainment, you have to be able to allow them to configure access to both those systems in a meaningful way that they can understand in a common way. And that's usually done through roles and things, and we'll get into that. Okay, then we have our policy decision point. Every time a user hits and tries to access something, we need to actually, we need to stop them at the policy enforcement point and go, whoa, 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 show us your ID. Okay, now we're going to go and we're going to ask for a decision. We know what your action is and we're going to see what, if you're allowed to do this or not. And of course, we have our PIP, our policy inf uh, information point, and the policy information point is our system of record. You have to know when Nova's creating something, when Nova's deleting it, how that resource appears, right? So when a resource, you have to be able to understand the life cycle of these resources, they pop up because they're gonna hit your policy decision point and say, is Sean allowed to do this? Well, maybe that resource was just freshly created and your, your policy decision point has to know when it's created and when it's deleted because that's how it will be able to make decisions on that. And then the last one is where do you store these policies? When you configure them, when you ask for decisions on that, and that's the uh, policy retrieval point. Okay, so here's the big diagram on that. The user comes in, asks for something, we stop, show me your identity, then we go down and we said, Sean is trying to perform this action on this particular resource. Is he allowed to do that? Well, we can get that decision back very quickly because you can imagine, I forget, some of the statistics on our bigger clouds, I mean, you're getting a boatload of these a second and you have to be, you have to be very fast with that decision point. There's our administration point. That's a difficult challenge, too, to make sense of this, to, to present it to the administrator in a meaningful way, in an easy way for him to configure it again across multiple platforms and, you know, hundreds or hundreds of thousands of resources. And uh, our PIP there is always monitoring the real, the real infrastructure, the system of record. Is it there? Is it not there? What does it actually look like? Okay. So that was what we were trying to do across multiple platforms. So when we first looked at this, we kind of went down and we looked at the uh, Open ID Connect. I think people, you know, a couple years ago with Keystone, it was federating Keystone. How do we federate identity across Keystone? And this is, this is advanced fairly well, and most people, I think, are doing this, where you kind of say, well, um, I don't know if this is Sean or not, but let me go ask this one system of record if, for the identity. So OIDC and OAuth2, it's still around identity. Very strong and rich protocols. The industry, in my opinion, has done a fairly good job of solving this problem and standardize in standards around it. Now, SAML, which you're familiar with, it comes out of OASIS. OASIS is a international standards organization. 
created by the United Nations to facilitate business-to-business -business interactions. So SAML comes along, it has a way to do assertions, it has a way to do attributes, and on attributes, so we have like a role-based access control, an RBAC, and then you can have an ABAC, an attribute-based, and SAML's pretty good about that. So we think of attributes, it's maybe I don't need to know everything about you. A good attribute example is you're a kid, you go to the fair, you want to ride a ride. It doesn't need to know, it doesn't need to see that kid's ID or anything like that. It just needs to know the kid's taller than this red line. That's the only attribute we need to know about it. And if you're taller than that red line, you get to access the ride. So that's a very way to have a easy way to all I want to know is that attribute. If you have that attribute, you can do this across you know, the cloud, anything like that. <clears throat> so what SAML did is it kind of stopped at the authorization piece. It said some simple authorizations, yeah, we're good at, but they intentionally stopped there and said the SAML uh, standard isn't going to take on that whole thing, but we have another OASIS standard, which is XACML, right? And so I think you're familiar with that. That's the extensible access control. Access control is exactly what we're trying to solve. Access control markup language. And so it encourages a separate PDP, which we see there. So that was a lot about if you break that out, then you can use XACML on that. And we use XACML in our decision, our policy decision point. Very, set, very fast, very robust, uh, uh, extensible way of doing that. And then each one in the XACML world has a subject, resource, action, and uh, environment, where environment could be an attribute. And I think I'm going to let Jeff talk now. Thanks, Sean. All right, so this, you know, Sean had the picture of, of where we want to go with the final product. Um, we're an experimentation type organization. So we said, let's experiment with this. We have two clouds, OpenStack on the left. I think I have a light here. There we go, OpenStack. And then we have the IBM Bluemix cloud here. Now we have a cloud identity and access management solution and it's here on the right, and you can access that through the edge server. So you see we had to do some uh, modifications to our policy.json in order to point Barbican and Oslo.policy over to our Cloud IAM policy decision point. In the demo that you're gonna see, uh, we have the edge server, we have the endpoint to manage access, and then our policy decision point. And then policies are created for two of the users that we'll have in the demo, and they are stored in Cloudant. And so that's the policy retrieval point that Sean talked about. When it comes to the OpenStack cloud, we have uh, Keystone, and we ha in Keystone we're using the user identification, so the global unique ID, as well as Keystone for tokens, and that token is used by Barbican. And then in Barbican, there's an Oslo.policy, and that's used to help with the policy enforcement point and uh, the decision that comes back from our solution. We did modify the policy.json file, and we're leveraging OpenStack's HTTP check uh, solution. So we're leveraging that. I'll show you the policy.json file in a second. But what happens is uh, Oslo.policy reads in that policy.json file, a request comes in, and then Oslo will say, okay, I need to make a decision on this based on some rules, right? And one of the things that we did is in the policy.json file, we have uh, a value in there that points to our policy decision point. And when the transaction comes in, it goes to Oslo.policy. It says, oh, hey, this is a remote or an HTTP check. It's a remote uh, decision that needs to be made and it sends the information across to our edge server and down to our policy decision point. The type of information that's in the body uh, is an action. It's the uh, user, which is the global unique ID, and also a resource. And in this case, in the experiment, it was the project global unique ID. Oops. Okay, I'm going the wrong way. 
One more. Ooh. All right, hold on. You guys want to see this all over again? One more. There we go. Okay, so the policy.json, you can see it uses this similar syntax. We put in here IAM and our endpoint right there, and that's for a policy decision point. And then you can modify the rules within the policy.json to show, hey, you know, go call IAM. So if you want to do a secret non-private read, the first entry in the rule is IAM, and that points us over to our policy that our, our policy decision point. Now, one of the things I do want to go back here. Oh, all right, go back here and say, you know, we do have this remote call, and for future work, we'd like to add a caching module here, and to use extendable cache so that we can increase the hit rate right there in Barbican. So the best thing is not to have to go over on the wire, right? And if we have that cache, we want to have a high hit rate in the cache, and the decision can be made right there in Barbican based on information that our policy decision point provides. So between Oslo.policy and Barbican, that enforces the decision that our Cloud AM solution uh, returns. So Steven's going to go ahead and show us a demo. Yep. All right. <clears throat> so for this demo, uh, we have two use cases. We have the case of Janice, who is our uh, development lead. Um, this person has administrator access, is able to you know, perform key creations and whatnot. And then the other user we have is Maureen. You know, she's a development intern, you know, new, coming in just for a little while. They shouldn't have access to uh, do anything administrative, just you know, an auditor role just is able to, to read, read, uh, read keys. So now we go to the demo. No, you put it on demo. <laughs> Do you have it on yours? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. We can just plug in yours. Pull that up. Sorry, the best part, and we screwed that up, huh? You know, I, I think I have it right here, too. Do you have it? Huh? Yeah, I have it. Yeah, no, that's, I thought that was it. Uh, Got it? Okay. Yeah. I'll let you get that. Yeah. All right, so we're through this demo. <clears throat> I have a pre-populated curl request here. So what we're doing is we're going to use Keystone for our, our authentication. So we're going to go and get a uh, token for this, you know, for the user Janice. You know, she's the administrator. So we're going to go perform that, go get the uh, user token. We're going to go ahead and save that off. And what we're going to be doing here is, you know, Janice is going to sit there and try and do a key creation. So she's going to go off and uh, perform that key creation. We're going to see it's going to go through. Uh, in that creation, it's going to go hit the uh, no, policy.json. It's going to go to that rule for a secrets post. And it'll go and hit the, uh, see the IAM rule, do the HTTP check. It's going to go across the wire. It's going to hit our cloud IAM solution. And then it's going to go evaluate the policy. It's going to come back and give us a decision. You can see here that when it would hit, it hit the uh, secrets post rule. And the response that returned from our cloud IAM solution is that, you know, response true. Janice is admin user has the ability to uh, do this key creation. 
she has this ability to do this key creation. So now we're going to come back as a, you know, come back to this curl request, pull it out, and we're going to come back as user Maureen. We're going to change up the request and go out and get that token as well. Um, Maureen's also going to uh, try and attempt to uh, do a key creation, but you know, uh, this person only has auto roll, so they shouldn't have access to do that. So we're going to get this token here and perform the, the same request for the key creation. Going to save that off. And then it'll go again you know, over the wire. It'll you know, send the attributes that it has for that uh, project global unique ID. And it should say that you know, on that request uh, that Maureen does not have access. So when it goes, it goes across the wire, it'll come back to that policy.json. It'll go evaluate the rule. And then it'll go on through. You know, hit the rule, make the response to our cloud IM solution, and comes back for a decision of false. That's going to get passed back to the, to the uh, policy.json, passed back to the uh, oslo.policy, and um, it'll, based on the decision that came back from, that, uh, from, that, from the cloud IM solution, it'll go ahead and either create or deny the user at that point. So I think now I'll uh, hand it over to Henry. While we get the uh, slides back, yeah. <laughs> So I'm Henry Nash, I'm a, a Keystone core, um, so I spent my time on, on Keystone identity stuff. So um, this ability to plug in external policy decision point is something that we've mulled on with Keystone for a while. Um, the uh, HTTP check stuff was, was written like three, three years ago and, and hasn't been touched since then. So it's a reasonable first solution, but probably not where you want to end up. So I'll just talk through that. Uh, right, so, um, so you know, so the, the, you, you know, this is kind of what we, we set out to do. Um, um, but you know, it's not just about that link across. Um, and, and you know, part of the problem is that the policy rules that are written might be um, unexpressible in OpenStack terms. I mean, one of the questions people have is, well, just do this in Keystone anyway. I mean, Keystone's a. If you, th if you think about the Keystone project structure, it's really a tagging mechanism for resources. So why can't you tag everything? You could tag spaces from Cloud Foundry and individual networks and so forth. And yes, you could. Um, the problem is, can you express the rules you want in Keystone language? And the answer is usually no. So either we try and you know, kind of expand all Keystone capabilities and make all OpenStack, um, uh, you know, the, sort of the natural OpenStack capabilities be, you know, cover the scope, you know, support XML or something like that, um, or we leave Keystone doing what it does best for OpenStack uh, resources and allow independent policy decision points and, and the other kind of, you know, PXP uh, components to be plugged in. And I think that is the right approach. Um, with that, of course, comes a problem that, you know, if you have multiple different clouds, then they each have today their own APIs for creating roles or rules, whatever it happens to be. And so you have to kind of marry up those APIs somehow as well. Um, and this is what you, you kind of saw, you know, happening right now, um, which is how how we did it for you know via the H, the HTTP check. Um, and, and as was said, um, that works okay. I don't think it could be a very good, good performance solution at scale because you're going to have an extra HTTP over the wire check for every call to an API in OpenStack, basically, which would be the result. Um, so you clearly are going to want some kind of caching mechanism, as was said. Um, and it probably isn't a straightforward HTTP cache you'd want because it'd be very hard to get the hit rate to what you want because if you think about multiple users hitting the same thing, you know, since user, the user ID will be part of the request, the, the caching may not be as easy as you think. So, um, so this leads us to the fact that actually, um, you know, you're gonna have, we're going to have to take a step back and think about how we're really going to do this properly. Um, um, 
because allied to that is this idea that you need to keep track of resources. Um, almost certainly, the types of policies will be maybe more fine-grained than OpenStack can support. So how is it that we're going to extend that? Um, and again, how do we marry these APIs? Um, so in the world where you actually have an external PDP, you know, you want Keystone to look after, okay, I federate into Keystone, I get my token, I'm allowed to make API calls, and I'm gonna, you know, this, this external PDP is gonna make the decision for me. Um, and actually what we did is we had spent some time with the Keystone team this morning, in fact, talking about this. And so what we've agreed within the Keystone team is that we really need a formal way of defining the interface to a policy decision, external policy decision point. HTTP is okay. It was sort of written because hmm, that'll be fun. People might find a use for that three years ago. Um, but it's very chatty. It's not necessarily what we want. Um, and so um, the Keystone team is going to be working this release. Uh, it'll take more than one release, I think, of defining that engine. There's at least four companies, IBM's one of them, who you know, identified the need for this solution. Each of the companies have actually had customers come to us um, and we've all implemented various prototypes like this one, <laughs> um, doing roughly the same thing and all come to the same conclusion that it's great for prototype and it's not great for production. So, you know, for people who are looking to do this today, HTTP check is kind of the only game in town. It works, you can do this. Um, and if it's just a few of the APIs you'd want to do, then you probably get away with it. If you want to wholesale um, um, hand off the policy decision point to an external entity, then I don't think the HTTP check's gonna be good enough on its own. Um, we're gonna do this in a uh, vendor neutral way. This, you know, so I, I, IBM are gonna be pushing for this, but we had the agreement this morning that, okay, we need to be in a vendor neutral way. Um, and that we will be publishing specifications. I'd encourage you to, to any of the interest, interested in it, please take part in that in the Keystone sessions, uh, the Keystone uh, uh, online specification process. Um, and if any of you are developers, I'm sure we'll be talking about this again at the um, developer meetup in, in um, Atlanta um, in the end of February. Um, so that's, so that's a good thing, I think. So we're gonna get that done. Um, and you know, it will take some time because this is an, this is an important um, an ex uh, interface. We don't want to bypass Oslo policy. Oslo policy is the way that all the different OpenStack projects get their policy decision made. So whatever we do, I think it's gonna, it's gonna be behind Oslo policy so that we're not gonna change that interface today so that you know, we won't break anything that's in production. The last thing um, I'm gonna leave you with and, uh, and I'd like to mull on and please feel free to give feedback, especially to the Keystone team is, and Sean kind of hinted at this in the first few slides, is that none of this solves the fact that each of the, each different cloud platform have come up with their own token format. Now, sometimes that's okay. If you have totally different administrative regions and you're federating between them, you probably don't want a common token format. It doesn't make any sense. But if what you have is a single cloud, which is just one admitted region, having different token formats is a pain in the backside. Yes, you, you can come up with, with, with exchange services and so forth, and, and maybe that has to be the short to medium term solution. But it does seem strange that we can't actually come up with some kind of common token format. Um, there are pros and cons to this, of course, because each of them have kind of well, have, have melded it, you know, to be optimal for their solution. Keystone and OpenStack, we went through at least three or four different token formats. Well, we try to get it right. Um, Finet token being the, the, the most recent and the one we're standardizing on. Um, but other cloud platforms have their own thing. What about containers, Kubernetes? You know, how, how are we going to do the same thing? in terms of both the policy decision and also by accessing the resource when we have a cloud that's made up of all these components. And I think many clouds will be made up of those components. You see the interest in containers all over the, the, the uh, conference this time, as it was last time. So we're gonna have combined clouds, certainly with containers and the different container managements and OpenStack, and probably a PAVs as well for good measure. So this is gonna be an emerging problem. Um, we're not proposing a solution today in terms of the token formats, but we're, we're, we're trying to start that discussion. 
about is the, does that make a sense for having a common token format that would allow us to actually have a more easier interchange once you've got your decision made, you can then send that token to any of the different services. So again, please engage with the Keystone community and others if you have views on that. So finally, that's all we have. We'll be happy to take questions on any of the above to any of us four. Thank you.